Kate, uh, I saw your thing about that stream. I'm sorry. Hey everyone! Welcome to hey, hey everyone! To Live brush. Welcome to hey. Revenge of the Lucigraph. <laughs> I think I think technically this is Revenge the of the Revenge of the Lucigraph. <laughs> oh yeah, Revenge of the Revenge of the Lucigraph. Uh, <laughs> of course, uh, we're joined by Tyler Jacobson. My name is uh, Ray Bonilla. Tyler, how are you doing, dude? I've been uh, good, man. We haven't talked. We talked for a little bit yesterday, but we haven't really like uh, talked long term. I guess. I yeah, how, I haven't seen you since then? last week. It's been yeah. great. It's been great. good. I'm, and I'm of course, saying, we're joined I've been by the pretty busy. Yeah, yeah. Okay. We're joined by the. Uh, uh, yeah, um, your, your time is done for the intro. Uh, we're go moving on to Kate. Okay, cut me off. Cut me off. We'll the, incredi the incredible, indestructible, phenomenal Kate Welch. Yeah. Oh. Applause sounds. Applause sounds. It's not, she, you know. So Kate's not our moderator. It's uh, Kate's our power raider. Okay. Yes. All right. So, power power aid. Power, power aid, aid commercial, really. Yeah. So uh, Tyler, what are we doing today? All right. We are. We're doing a new thing, everybody. All you folks out there tuning in, we are. What, what we want to show is. Trying to phrase this right, we want to show that artists have very different approaches, right? Even if they're trained the same, like Ray and I are trained the same. We went to the same school, we took almost all the same classes. Yeah. So we want to, um, you know, forgive the pun, illustrate. Um, <laughs> and I'm fired. I'm fired now. Um, we want to illustrate that by working from exactly the same reference. So we got this awesome shot, continuing our '80s movie um, portraiture of Michelle mm -hmm. Nichols from Star Trek II, The Wrath of Khan, arguably the greatest Star Trek movie ever made. It's debatably, um, but it's a good deba movie. No, well, factually, the greatest yeah. Star Trek film ever made. Okay, and, that's much um, better. Okay, <laughs> and so we're both, we're both gonna paint um, 
I'm going to paint in oils again. I'm, I'm probably going to do a pretty direct a la prima kind of effect. That's just wet and wet. Um, just wet. And what's that? Paint. What's that surface that you got there on? It looks like you got some sort of. Uh, it looks like a, a different. Well, it's a different start for you, right? I mean, uh, you started right. more of like on a, on a like a warm wash the last time. Right. So this time I'm doing something a little different. This is a, another one of those aluminum panels by Artifacts, but it's linen mounted. It's not the finer, it's sort of the rougher linen that they offer. Um, but I also uh, gessoed it with gray gesso. Um, my oh. palette is also gray, so they're both mid-gray. And the, the reason I'm doing that is it, it kind of helps, working from mid-gray helps you kind of see your the actual um, value of your darks and your lights. And having a palette that's the same color allows you to not be surprised when you bring your paint over to the canvas. Yeah, and that's it. Huge help, huge help, you know. Yeah, it's, it's not you, required for painting, but it will, uh, you, it's, if you're starting out, especially, and you're trying to control values, I mean, that is just a really huge help, uh, a, a huge thing you can do. Sorry, I didn't and it takes, I don't know, but I'm just saying, I'm adding to that, like, it takes yeah. ages to, to mix the right accurate color when you're, if you have, like, a white palette and a gray canvas. Totally. Um, or vice versa, you know, you're just like, you keep mixing and it looks right to you. And then you get over here and you're like, oh, crap, it's completely different. Um, right. So color and color and value are all contextual. They're all based on what's around them. So um, set yourself up for success by trying to match your palette to what you're working on. Um, so that's what I'm doing. I'm working in oils. Um, what are you going to do, Ray? Well, uh, after you had that huge sort of advertisement for a uh, uh, pitch for matching your uh, your tone of your drawing <laughs> the tone of your painting to the tone you're gonna of work your on a pitch canvas. black I'm, yeah I'm, I'm working so I'm, i have a gray palette just like tyler uh does um and, but the surface that i'm working on here uh is a uh a paper uh that i uh, covered in uh, white uh, acrylic and then i stained uh in burnt umber now what i was going to do today uh, was going to be an underpainting uh, using gouache, where I was I would lift out um, essentially uh, the I lay down a layer of gouache, which is just a, a um, I have it here somewhere. I'll uh, if I find it, I don't know. Uh, it's a just an opaque watercolor, uh, and uh, I would lift it out by rewetting it with a brush, uh, and I would establish my lights and darks there, which is why I toned it white. So. I basically remove it and anything I want it to be super, super light, the lightest of values, I would leave, uh, I would sort of erase until I got to the bottom of that uh, uh, layer of that white acrylic uh, uh, grounds is what is the term. The problem is um, I used acrylic white instead of acrylic gesso. Now, uh, acrylic white uh, is fine. It's a, it covers up ash. and everything like that just um, fine. Um, but the problem is it leaves, uh, when used sort of uh, uh, to the amount uh, that you need in order to cover something up to, to stain it or uh, to, gra uh, to, to prep uh, my, my paper so I can, uh, it'll accept the acrylics just fine. I have to put a lot of it on. And when you build up acrylics a lot, it tends to, to a really thick layer, it tends to be a little bit plasticky. And so uh, I drew everything out on uh, a colored pencil and usually uh, with gesso, because it's got a little bit of tooth in it, uh, the color pencil becomes really dark. And it's really nice. You know, you, and you can do that with graphite if you wanted to as well. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, the problem with, since it was on acrylics and it was a little bit slick, uh, my dark color pencil showed up a little light. And so when I stained it uh, with uh, gouache, it destroyed the, uh, it completely covered up my drawing. So I couldn't see it anymore. That's not a problem, and I actually had a call last minute audible. And I will be doing the uh, gouache lift out for the next uh, piece and show you how to do all of that stuff. Yeah, uh, it's challenging, but it's super yeah. cool effect, so. Yeah, so, uh, so, but today I'm gonna be essentially, um, and I just decided this maybe five seconds before uh, uh, Kate had told us we were live. Um, I'm gonna be doing an underpainting uh, using, uh, Burnt umber and white. Uh, what do you think about that, Tyler? I like that actually. Yeah. That's something yeah. we used to do in school quite a bit. Wow. Was, um, it would either be um, brown matter or lizard, which is one of our favorite like underpainting pigments. And brown right. matter lizard is essentially just burnt umber and a lizard crimson. Kind of looks 
the set of focus, but it looks like this. It's yeah. kind of like a crimson dark, brown. Yeah, dark red. Oh yeah, or maybe without that. About that. There we are. Anyways, it's kind of reddish, um, reddish brown. Yeah. It's really nice um, to. I'm going to do my. I'm going to reinforce my drawing here. Maybe we could talk about that. Like my drawing, we both um, projected our drawings down mm -hmm. um, with a. Uh, we found some interesting new projection software that comes on the iPad. Yeah, um, new to us. I mean, it might have been around for a billion years, but you know, uh, yeah, you know, for all us. for for argument's sake, it's it's brand new and just discovered by us. You know, um, I'm actually mixing two um, colors together. It's um, Winsor Newton's Burnt Umber, which is um, if you find it on the color wheel, it sits in the orange area of the color wheel, but it's pretty muted. That's kind of orange gray, and um, and then I mix that with a Winsor Newton Alizarin Crimson, which I just love this pigment. Yeah, it's a great um, one. I don't know. I, I probably hold it up over here, but anyways, um, it's Alizarin Crimson is this, uh, you know, it's exactly what it is. Pretty much, it's crimson. Like it is a beautiful yeah. transparent red, and it's kind of on the. I mean, we, we would say it's sort of leaning towards blue just a little bit yeah it's like a dark red violet yeah yeah, yeah. so um, i've mixed awesome. those two together almost equal parts to get this really nice reddish brown yeah and you could uh, the the advantage of mixing your own is that you can let's say you don't like it uh you want it just a little bit red you know uh in in sort of the browns you could just add a little bit of lizard crimson like a, uh versus a lot maybe you want a ton of uh, of red in that brown. Uh, then you could just add a little bit more lizard and crimson. So um, yeah, it, it's really advantageous, you know. Uh, and I'm just gonna. Oh, go ahead. Did you guys make your gray palettes or did you buy them? I made oh, mine. Good question. Um, yeah, yeah we, I, made I put too. a. Yeah, so I I took a piece of um like cardboard um or like illustration board essentially like that you would back a comic with or something like that like a thick piece of cardboard. Um, and then I just painted that with a gray gesso that um, Liquitex makes. Um, it's right. it's like almost perfectly neutral value. So um, yeah, and yeah, that's the same gesso that I put on my canvas. So. Yeah, and I uh, I just basically mixed uh, a, uh, a, a gray with gesso and acrylic black. And uh, I kind of have a good handle of what middle value is. I mean, sometimes I have a middle value paper like a, a gray paper uh, that I usually uh, sometimes I'll use for um, just for reference. And heck, you can even go to Home Depot, get a free paint chip, you know, those of middle value gray and just do that. And I just slather the back of the glass directly um, with, with just don't let that dry. So that's, that's another way you can do it, but e either, mm -hmm. or it's sitting underneath the glass and uh, undisturbed. Yeah, and I, I even like to, um, I don't have one now, but I, I, I like to, on the edge of my palette, like if, my, if it's a piece of glass, right? I've, I ordered a special piece of glass off the website, but um, it's just a thick piece of glass. And then on the, on the side, I like to have a full value range so that if I can, um, I can kind of put the paint that I've mixed up near that value range just to get an idea of where it sits um, oh, in value. I didn't know that. Something to try out, you know? Yeah. Well, you didn't share that with me. Well, it's tough to be a really good friend. I didn't want you to know. I didn't want you to know. <laughs> so, um, so what I'm going to do here is I'm just going to take this brown that I created um, and I'm going to reinforce the graphite drawing that I did um, just so that when I start painting on this, um, that nice, intense, dark red brown will come through into the wet paint. Yeah, I guess we should start start painting, right? We well, could just I, chat here on and have the camera on like a still flat canvas, and nothing yeah. happens for <laughs> two hours. I think that's what people chimed in for, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh no! All right. Okay. Cool. Nick DeLuca, ninety-six. Asks, Nick, wow. Yeah, Nick? yeah. The Nick DeLuca. When taking slash gathering reference photo for an illustration, what are some of the things you guys look for, and what are some common mistakes to avoid? Um, I personally look for like very clearly defined shadows that gets you a long way. Um, it, 
the reason I look for that is it helps me get a drawing down faster. If it's, if it's like, I wouldn't even say over lit, but if it's like lit from a whole bunch of different angles and there's all these different shadows that you have to track, it ends up taking like a lot longer to get this drawing in because you want to track all that stuff. So I like to have, you know, one or two light sources, nice, clear, um, hard cast shadows. And um, that's kind of the reference I'm looking for. It's sort of like, and if you guys saw the previous episode where I was working on that Ripley piece, um, that turned into a, a difficult struggle because there was there was some really subtle lighting going on that, that you know, right. you see that kind of lighting in movies all the time. And so it can be hard when you pull a still from a movie if you're not um, being careful and watching um, all the shadows and lighting construction. But I like to have pretty clear stuff. And this, you know, stuff from like old TV, like Star Trek um, or the Star Trek films, they, they have a very specific lighting setup and it's always pretty hard shadows. So this is yeah, a, this ended it's up kind being of like almost like like theater uh, lighting, right? It had its roots in it. It almost feels like, right? It like kind of that uh, uh, like black box theater uh, style of like uh, harsh uh, direct lighting, you know? Um, yeah, that's what it looks like to me. I mean, I'm, I, I'm not sure like exactly what it would be called, but um, I love it because it's just really great reference. Yeah, and like our goals, it, it all depends on what your goal is with the reference. And, and for, you know, for our sake, in, in, especially in, in these things, uh, you know, I'm trying to create the illusion of three dimensions on a two-dimensional surface. So uh, I need the reference to have that information that allows me to create that illusion because it really is it's just an illusion uh, that we're, right. we're creating and so uh, if i have uh, a ton of uh, form uh, and cast shadows which are basically the two types of shadows uh, that exist uh, in nature and uh, I, I can explain a little bit more when i get to the where they are when i get to the um, uh, the face and whatnot um, the more i have if i have a ton of them then it's going to be really easy for me to uh, explain and create the illusion of those three three dimensions. Uh, and if it doesn't have that much, then it's going to be a little bit more difficult because then I'm going to have to rely on a uh, little bit more uh, subtler uh, plane changes or, you know, when the, when the let's just say, uh, or the side of the form changes, like you go from the top of that nose to the bottom of the nose, you know. Uh, and so uh, if I don't have that clear information, then I'll have to really um, lean on my knowledge of the structure. Um, and it takes it just a little bit longer. And so it's a lot more efficient to work with, uh, you know, strongly lit reference if your goal is to sh show those, you know, accentuate uh, those uh, three dimensions. I yeah, that's something we learned this isn't school. like a rule, right? Like it, we, no, we're no, not yeah, saying like totally. you have to use a reference like that, but yeah. it is a way of like allowing yourself to understand, especially in an early stage of learning, you know, how to paint form and wrap form and turn form. Totally. It's a great way to um, understand all those things. Then you can start like building on top of that and getting real right. tricky. Right. Because it, 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 you'll see the patterns when you start to really work with them. Uh, but. I've got a, a series of more questions for you guys. They're coming wow. fast this is and great. loose today. Hammonds nice. in, the, in the chat has a question specifically for Ray. I think it's a really good question. And I want... I want yeah. um, a thoughtful answer out of this one. Two trains leave. Yeah. Two trains leave Boston. One carrying Sergeant, the other Zorn. Which arrives in Chicago first for the perfect time to catch the evening light? <laughs> <laughs> the um, answer. The answer is the train with Frank Duvenick on it. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> I was I was gonna say a, a value of n, which is undefined. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but it depends on the quantum state of the two trains. And yeah, yeah. We get into that later. Yeah. yeah. Thanks for joining us, Bryce. <laughs> um, right, so, next question. Obviously, yeah. excellent answer. Evaquate asks, uh, do you always start with a pencil sketch or do you also freehand to start? Um, I also, yeah. oh, actually, that kind of is good. We wanted to talk about this. Um, yes, I, yeah. I will freehand. I'll freehand starts as well. But our whole goal here was to, um, we wanted to get into painting as fast as possible. Um, and so, and this plays into, you know, working as an illustrator as well. If you need to get into, you need to get the job done really fast. So you want, you know, highly accurate drawing, highly efficient, putting it down as fast as possible. Um, so we projected these um, drawings down just so that we had the drawing 
in there and now we can jump right into painting because um, mm -hmm. we can do I, I think later we can do episodes on drawing for sure but that was not our primary focus for this episode yeah, yeah absolutely do you guys yeah, want to talk I, about the the programs that you use that you've discovered yeah so i uh used a program called da vinci i uh which basically just uh functions as a, like a, a projector essentially it uses your phone use your phone and then uh, the image is superimposed on whatever your camera is pointed towards. And so if you have it toward, on a surface, you can uh, position your reference and, uh, and draw it up like that. And uh, what, what did you use again, Tyler? You had sent me it. And, uh, yeah, I'm yeah. blanking on the name right now. It was like, I want to say Camera Lucid. It, it was like a reference to the Camera Lucia. Uh, from yeah, the, the there, there, and there, there's like a billion of them on, on, uh, you know, on the respective app stores, the Google and Android ones. Um, yeah, and uh, you know, I had freehanded my um, uh, my Decker painting uh, last, uh, uh, you know, uh, for the last, you know, a painting, our first painting, essentially, uh, and um, you know, there's nothing uh, wrong with that. Uh, I mean, I I did it because. Uh, I thought, okay, well, uh, it, it was uh, it was the quickest, most efficient way to to get it done for me at the time, um, and sometimes that's not the case. Sometimes you have a, you know, like for for me, for instance, I set up a lot of reference, and I take a lot long time on my reference. I I compose, I spend a lot of time composing and getting everything the exact size, the exact position that I want it, kind of like a film director would, you know, uh, a very common way for uh, a lot of uh, artists uh, to work like this, and so. Uh, then, uh, if I have everything exactly where I want it, then uh, I will oftentimes uh, project it because uh, why? Because uh, I want to get a result, uh, the highest quality result, in the most efficient manner. Uh, because I don't have a million years to to paint something. Uh, uh, and so, um, artists in the past, you know, some of the great uh, figurative uh, pieces, you know, a lot of that stuff was. Uh, especially uh, around the 19th century, a lot of that stuff was done from life, and they actually had sets built like like actual mm -hmm. you know a special effects company would you know or, or like a, a movie a film studio would they would build sets and uh, you know clothe actors in costumes and have them uh, sit uh for you know hours uh while they are painted drawn and painted from life uh and so yeah, it's, it's uh, hardcore yeah and, and that's been around at, at the time you know that was uh the speed of things, the speed of the world was such that it allowed for that. Uh, but uh, in, since the advent of photography, and this is during the 19th century as well, um, a lot of artists uh, saw the, the use uh, of using uh, photography to help them aid uh, in um, image creation. And to the second point, you know, uh, 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 projection has been, you know, it's nothing new either. I mean, the, the camera lucida, that we just uh, uh, alluded to, uh, the uh, camera obscura, you know, that Caravaggio used, uh, and all of these were yeah. tools, you know, uh, that uh, that um, artists used to get their idea down on the the canvas. Now, the the whole painting, you know, when you turn into this thing into a painting, you know, that stuff goes out the window, right? Because you were just trying to get everything in the right place. Uh, yeah, and, it's all about accuracy, right? If that's yeah, what you're yeah. interested in or care about. And if you don't know what you're doing and don't, don't know what to look for, uh, a lot of times um, it's kind of useless. You, you kind of fake uh, what looks like a finished drawing, but really uh, it isn't. And so uh, when we're going into this painting um, uh, for, for the both of us, uh, it's uh, basically we're using our knowledge uh, of, of form and value and application. Uh, so yeah, uh, and I don't want you know neither of us want to get lost really in the, in the weeds, so to speak. Yeah. So we're we're just trying. We have the drawing there to guide us through. Um, and you know our whole it's going to be a painting, so it's about our paint marks, not about our our drawing lines, so to yeah. speak. Um, but it's I mean I guess this kind of leads to a, a weird little. We can do like a small, short little history lesson on projection. I mean we, we learned from a lot of teachers that use artographs, and they were these big giant opaque projectors that you would mount to a table and you'd put a piece of paper in it and it had optics that would project that drawing downward onto a table surface. I have something pretty similar made by a Japanese company 
it's called a copy cocky cobra or something like that but it's yeah. an opaque projector and i love that thing i still use it to this day when i'm when i'm working on stuff but i like these new tools so i'm a big advocate of um, people embracing new tools whenever they arrive i'm not really a purist when it comes to how you get your drawing down if you want to grid it and get it down that way go for it but um i as an illustrator need to work pretty fast so you guys are saying you're tracers so yes trace. i mean tyler is yeah yeah, I totally. Am, uh, <laughs> however, you get the job done. <laughs> however, you get the job done. No, in, in all seriousness, it uh, it doesn't uh, matter, and it, it it's it doesn't it's not going to add anything that isn't already in your skill set. So, like, if you're not great at value, tracing is not going to help you. You're not great at form, chase is not going to help you. Uh, there's going to be a certain point where uh, your training has to take over, and so all these are super. Uh, these are just tools uh, as a professional that you use um, to get uh, to get all your work done. And you know what? It, and it's not limited to uh, to just fine art and, and for gallery paintings uh, as well. Uh, I mean, the, the, you for any time you have a deadline, you got to have a lot of stuff done. I think there's a lot of mysticism behind the whole thing and unreal yeah. expectations, you know, that are placed upon uh, uh, artists. Uh, and I think that's mostly artist's fault too, because it's a lot easier to um, explain that, like, or to tell people like it was easy, or like, you know, I, I just was born with some sort of talent, you know, uh, and that's unattainable, you know. Um, right. Right. And so, you know, that it, this all this stuff sort of gets lost, and you know, a lot of times, uh, camera obscures and all these things that were being used, you know. Um, Artists back in the day were running, um, employed tons of apprentices, and they were running essentially design firms. And you could think of them like the big tech companies, you know. And so they had uh, essentially intellectual property, you know. And right, right. And so they're not going to tell them, you know, they want to get hired as much as possible. And so the last thing you want to do is share how you did it, right? Because I wouldn't. Uh, I, I would. Yeah, you don't want to share it, your technology. Yeah, um, but so. That's why a lot of this stuff sort of sort of mass in, in, in history. Um, but it, I mean, nowadays it, it really doesn't matter uh, at all. None of this stuff really matters. Um, well, there's so it, many it, great it, artists out there using modern tools, to, you know, build them. Um, you know, a, a friend of mine, I imagine you guys should all look him up, Chase Stone. You know, he builds almost almost all of his reference he builds digitally. Chase is so and just great, creates yeah. these absolutely beautiful pieces that are just hyper realistic fantasy imagery. Um, you know, I've chatted with him a whole bunch about how he goes through this process, and he says, you know, it's pretty much a rabbit hole that he ends up going down, building just about everything in the image in ZBrush and then lighting it in Moto or Blender. Right. Um, this is all amazing tools to make really cool imagery. I, I, um, you know, but, and, and I think Gray I... and I have talked a lot about that kind of stuff. Go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, no, I was just going to say uh, that, you know, where does that come from? I mean, that's something new uh, in terms of in conceptually speaking. I mean, artists for years, uh, Tintoretto, you know, classic example, yeah. would build models of everything, every single figure in his composition as references and spend tons of time doing that. To get Thomas everything Blackshear. In, Thomas Blackshear. Uh, so James Gurney, uh, the use of maquettes, you know, to... Uh, as information, you know, um, so this is just another, you're solving the same problem, you're just doing it with a different type of technology, you know, uh, and so instead of clay uh, and, uh, you know, uh, found objects and things like that, or instead of logic, it's just digital sculpture, it's the same thing. Um, yeah, I think that, I guess the moral of this story is don't, don't let anyone tell you how you can reach a final. Yeah. Um, what, what, as long as you're not plagiarizing anybody, go for it. Like you use whatever right. tools are at your disposal. And if you're in illustration, you know, you got tight deadlines that you got to do what you got to do to get the job done fast. Yeah. And I, 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 uh, I, I absolutely agree, uh, you know, with, with that sentiment, you know, it's, um, it doesn't diminish, uh, anything, you know, learning, uh, you still need to learn the fundamentals. Um, yeah. Uh, because, you know, like for for instance, you know, the thing about uh, uh, projecting uh, and uh, your references, you have to understand what lines. You can't just trace everything because then, uh, you know, the second you look back and look at your drawing, it's not going to be a very clear roadmap of where to put your values down. 
Um, right. And, right. And, and so uh, you have to learn, you know, what do you do? So you lean on your, your knowledge of form and you lean on your knowledge of, uh, uh, of structure. You know, uh, the fact that like uh, this area around here, you know, uh, you have uh, the mandible that's, uh, uh, for instance, the mandible that's running into the sternal uh, mastoid. Uh, which is a neck muscle that comes all the way across and it hooks up to the pit of your neck uh, uh, where uh, your essentially collarbone or clavicle uh, meets up with the center of uh, your ribcage or thorax uh, uh, known as a sternum. And so I'm thinking about that structure as I am placing this value down. That's a lot to think about, right? I mean, when you're first starting out. Uh, and so it takes years of practice and um, just failing and you know, and doing it uh, time and time again for this stuff to uh, to look effortless or to be, for it to be sort of second nature. Uh, yeah, I mean, it helps to know what lies underneath, right? Um, yeah, it totally. informs everything that you do. Because you're, you're telling the story of the form, uh, right? Uh, especially if your goal is to make things three-dimensional, uh, like, like or feel three-dimensional, communicate that visually. So you have to understand uh, this, the structure on it. Uh, and so... Uh, and, and that's how you actually are, uh, you, that knowledge allows you to be a, a better uh, gauge of, of, uh, of your work and also your painting as it's ha happening, you know, it's, uh, and you could say, okay, well, I didn't get the result that I wanted. Um, why? And you could say like, oh, wow, I made a, this weird stroke, like for instance, right here, this stroke that I have right here, it's, it's not going to work. It's too rounded. Uh, and the reason why is there's this uh, bone right here called the zygomatic bone. It's your, your cheekbone, but it runs all the way uh, up and around. Uh, and it's a super important uh, bone of the head. And so if uh, the, it's a very rigid structure and, you can, and it's always often going to be very pointy. And so if you round it off, you're not describing something that's uh, rigid and clear. You're just describing something that's a little bit more mushier. Uh, and mm -hmm. as human beings, we understand uh, inherently, you know, when something looks like a human being and when something doesn't. Uh, and this is one of those those areas. And so what I'm going to do is, I, I, you know, you'll see this often. I'll, I'm laying down a, a, an initial dark tone uh, just to get things covered so I can have, give context to the values I'm putting in the face. And then I'm going to come back and paint over uh, and correct my marks. Uh, and uh, you, you're going to be doing that time and time again because you're trying to gauge uh, you know, uh, how well you're uh, expressing those visual cues. Um, I've got another question for you guys from a day read yeah. from Mexico. Um, do you recommend drawing from nature and how does it help later on with more imaginative works? Oh man, that, this is an excellent question. Um, yeah, great question. Super important to draw from life and nature. And um, I kind of put it in, I, fr I frame it in this way of you're building a visual library. So sometimes you may not have reference or may not be able to get reference for something. So if you're doing lots of life drawing and uh, drawing from the real world and, and analyzing it as you do it, so understanding what's going on with light and color and form, that, that, helps, that helps you invent things. It's something I lean on all the time. Like I may not have reference for something that's, you know, because I do so much fantasy work. Um, I may not have reference for some particular dragon or creature or landscape. Um, so I lean on my knowledge of, you know, how light and form works based on my experience of observing it. So every time I'm out painting something in, in life or looking at photographs of real things, I'm sort of mentally cataloging like, okay, so that's what's going on with the light there. Um, and that becomes really important. Um, I lean on that stuff so often when I'm designing uh, creatures that particular creatures, like Ray was talking a lot about anatomy a minute ago, and that is, that's something I lean on a lot because um, there's so much going on in creature design that needs to feel realistic, and that's what I'm after. Yeah, totally Ray, what do you yeah. think about that? What do you think? No, absolutely. I think nature is probably the, the greatest of, of teachers because it's basically you, it's, your, it's the shortest distance between, there's nothing filtering or in your way between you and the subject that you're seeing. It's basically what you can absorb, right? Uh, on a physical level. So it's not, uh, you're not 
it's un, an unedited image essentially, right? So because when you mm -hmm. draw from photographs, it's edited, right? It's it's looked at from uh, the lens, uh, the particular lighting and how exposed it was. And so all that stuff is sort of handled for you. Uh, when you are looking at something from life, you see thousands of things. So how, how do you go about distilling that down uh, and um, basically putting it into managing it so that you can express it on, on a surface or whatever surface you're working on? Uh, I think uh, drawing from life absolutely teaches you that because you're literally taking something three-dimensional uh, and making it feel three-dimensional on a two-dimensional surface. Um, and that mentally, you're training your, uh, the mental part uh, of, of your vision uh, is, I think, absolutely paramount uh, when it comes to uh, you know, learning how to, to draw and paint. Yeah, and this is all, I guess we can apply all this to uh, realistic painting. You know, Ray and I are both totally. uh, realist painters, but you know, it depends on, if you have like a sliding scale of stylization, it can still be applied. You know, um, you're just being more stylized in your uh, drawing and construction. But yeah, yeah, and this even is if all, you were all useful stuff. E even if you were you're you're uh, like a non-object object oriented painter, if you were an abstract painter, uh, you can absolutely benefit from this because the thing is, when you come into drawing, you actually don't understand how the world how you how you view the world like how you view the world when you come into your first drawing class has been uh you has been sort of predetermined before you even set in right and i do this all the time yeah. with my students you know when you're born uh the 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 thing that the human eye and mind is brain is really good at is pattern recognition so uh and it's it's a survival mechanism right it's it's the reason why you can tell the difference really quickly between a chair and a Bengal tiger, right? Because if you sit on mm -hmm. one, it's comfy. Uh, and if you sit on the other one, uh, not, not so much. Uh, it could so, be comfy. You don't know. But it, could, it could be comfy. It could be comfy. Not be but I've, I've, I've sat on some pretty uncomfortable chairs, man. So, uh, <laughs> and so, I've sat on uh, some pretty comfortable tigers. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. Okay, so, so I guess that was the worst analogy ever. I guess... Uh, yeah, dude. We need to actually, um, can we take a break here and yeah, okay, yeah. your analogies? Yeah, yeah. And, and look at some more headshots and uh, for <laughs> opens up for additions for another co-host, you know. But uh, so what, what, yeah. I, uh, what I tell my students, I, I draw them three things, right? Uh, and I, I draw them uh, a, a line with some squiggly uh, uh, smaller line, uh, a circle with some squiggly smaller lines protruding from that, uh, from the circle, right? And so... Uh, and I ask them, what, what is this? And everyone says sun, right? And everybody agrees with the sun. And then I just basically draw like almost like a, a triangle. And then I uh, put almost like a cloud around the triangle uh, and on the, t on the tip of the triangle. And I, and I ask, uh, what, what is this? Uh, what do you think this is? Uh, and they say tree. And I say, cool, yeah, tree. Everyone's agreed on it and everybody agrees. Uh, and then I, I put a bunch of triangles. I put a triangle on top of a, a, a rectangle and then a smaller rectangle uh, near the middle bottom of, of, of the first rectangle, the larger rectangle. Uh, and then I put another little uh, sort of squirrely uh, cloud, you know, uh, shape uh, on the top of one of the rectangles. And I say, w w what do you think this is? And everyone says house. And so... I, I say sun tree house, right? And so I look at it, I said, everyone got that correctly. That I was trying to communicate a sun, I was trying to communicate a tree, I was trying to communicate a house. But the problem is the sun doesn't look, is not the actual sun is not a sphere with squiggly lines, small squiggly lines shooting out of it, right? Right, right. right? And a, uh, a tree is not a triangle with like a cloud-like shape around it, right? Because I point to the actual tree. It's like no tree in nature actually looks like that. Uh, and the same thing goes for, uh, you know, uh, the house. Uh, it's, there's, there's no way this house would actually function, I would say. It was like, yeah, I wouldn't want to live there. Uh, and so, so that sounds kind of why exciting. is I'd, I'd try it out. Yeah. <laughs> 
that that's your why point, your point, that, right? That's why we're not doing this in person, Tyler. That's one of the I mean, you know, <laughs> pandemic aside. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, so my point is like, why why is it, why is it that it's instant recognizable and you know what it is? Well, it's because you're trained uh, early on to to recognize pattern because that's that's what the human mind is really good at. The problem is when you're actually trying to observe nature and draw and paint what's actually there that goes directly against that um, that bias, you know, that pattern bias. And so you're fighting that every single time you go and try and draw something. Um, and and you can find that, you know, a lot of drawing mistakes, like for instance, I've, I've seen when you try and draw an eye that's in the three quarter view or like on a profile view, you know, I've seen people draw the eye as if we're looking straight at them uh, because that's what they remember as a pattern for an eye. But it's not the because they identify that as eye instead of the right, structure a symbol of the eye. Right, right. right. The so symbol is very different from um, the actual form of an of a of a real item. Right. And so imagine going through that. I mean, the the the, the heaps of people that go through life like that, not knowing that that's not actually what things actually look like. It's just a symbol for them uh, it's like a hieroglyphic that you uh, you you mentally a mental hieroglyphic that you've stored in your head it's crazy right and so um as an artist when you train from nature you learn how to uh basically see nature as it is you know which is essentially form that's lit uh, by light and um you know, that's, that's a, a powerful thing. And if you don't have that, if I, I honestly, I, I will go out and say you're really missing out art, artistically um, because uh, and developmentally if you don't have that experience because your eye is uh, untrained. And when you don't have a, a trained eye, then you can't see the beauty uh, in the nature. It's hard to see the beauty in the nature around you. Uh, and, and some people who haven't, trained at all in school and to become artists have had that some sort of training. Everyone's had that, that training, whether it's a traditional or untraditional, but they've had that experience. And so um, that's why you can talk to like a carpenter or, uh, you know, uh, a chef, you know, and kind of talk about the same things or, or, you know, people that have had to try and actually look uh, really and look hard at, uh, the actual thing that they're doing and figure out how it comes together. I mean, it's, um, it's, it, I, I think it's a, uh, important and essential, uh, part of the artist development. So sorry to go but on, it's one of the, on that, but yeah. <laughs> but it's one of the hard things, right? It is, um, yeah. learning how to see or learning to understand what you're seeing is, um, is a chat is hard. Um, totally. but once you, once you start to understand what you're seeing, you can manipulate it. Um, I, I mean, I, that's something I do in illustration all the time is like, I know what, what's going on with particular light structures or forms or totally. you know, how light passes through objects. Um, right. That, like once you know all of those things and what you're seeing, you can just mess around with it like crazy. Yeah. Like for instance, that's the fun I, stuff. I, I drew out this whole, the nose and everything like that. And I separate everything out because that was what was in the reference. But in reality, it's in shadow, and I don't really need it for uh, to show the form uh, necessarily uh, and to show the sense of light. So I got rid of that, right? But if I didn't understand that structure, I would just copy to try and copy exactly what I was seeing, which would be a bunch of random, you know, I would interpret everything as a random set of like uh, uh, lights and darks that have no rhyme or reason, but. Because you know you train, you see the pattern in things in nature, and, and it goes back to what you were saying, Tyler, about like you using that, you studying nature to understand how things work, so that you can use use that to create things that don't exist uh, in in the natural world. You know? Yeah. Hey, I've got a question for you guys. It's kind of unrelated, but both yeah. with this these paintings and with your Ripley and Deckard, I noticed Ray, you start with like blocking in the background, and in this case, Uhura's hair. Mm -hmm. um, Tyler, you go right for the facial detail, which is one of the things that I thought would be really interesting to compare when you're painting from the same reference. But can yeah. you guys explain why individually you each go for that approach? Right, oh. so um, um, I guess I'll jump in. I, yeah, why don't um, you go first, yeah. So I'm actually, what I'm doing is I'm, I'm 
blocking in my shadow areas. Um, you know, a, a lot of times with an accurate portrait, it's all about how the shadows are shaped. Um, if you can get the shadow shapes right, it will read um, as that person. Right. So I'm just trying to make sure, based on my drawing, like we talked about putting our drawing down. My drawing wasn't like a perfect uh, value drawing of her face. It was just landmarks for me. It was coded for me. You know, I had hard lines where I wanted hard shadows. I had squiggly lines where I wanted them. Soft transitions. So I am, now that I've had that down, I, I painted, you saw me paint in like sort of a reddishness over all the lines. And now I'm just blocking in my shadow areas and some of my midtones so that I can keep, I can continue to keep maintaining the structure. Um, when it comes to oil painting, I'm, I'm pretty a la prima, like just straight down. Um, I don't know if it's good for me to work that way, but it's so it's just the way I, I end up doing it. Makes sense. And Ray, yeah, go ahead. And Ray's doing it. Um, you know, he's working more as an underpainting to start with. So, but Ray, why don't you kind of dig into that? Explain why why someone might do that. Yeah. So you know, I, I like to have a um, a sense of you know. And this is sometimes it's uh, sometimes I like to usually have a sense of, of value, know where my how light or how dark to make something. And so a uh, a common way of, of painting uh, that was done forever, um, uh, because what Tyler is doing right now, this sort of a la prima, which is taking the actual trying to match the exact color uh, value uh, uh, and form and put it all at once is a, a fairly a modern way of establishing paint um, or placing down uh, uh, paint. Uh, and so this way that, that I'm doing right here, was it's actually been a little bit more common. And the, the whole point is basically it's to compartmentalize issues uh, in a given image. And so uh, light and value uh, and drawing uh, can kind of uh, fall in uh, into or value in composition can fall into almost like a, a similar step. Uh, and so what a lot of artists do is they uh, paint the value of uh, the form that they're painting first uh, so that when they go back in color, they just basically match the color to the value. And that, that is a very efficient process because most of the time when you're matching or get trying to get the right color, you're really trying to get the right value uh, for the most part. Uh, and, yeah, the color almost um, doesn't even matter. I no, mean, doesn't the value is yeah. the king. Yeah, and I, you know, I I love color. Um, that's like my one of my things that that people know my work for. You know, is is the color. Yeah. Uh, and um, I'm just and saying, it doesn't matter, dude. You should. It yeah, doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Yeah, there's color does <laughs> not matter. So what I love does no, not no. matter. You know, no, but yeah, it, it really it it actually makes a little <laughs> impact on it. it not nearly as much impact on a given image uh, as uh, the actual value of it. So um, I'm establishing it in uh, brown and white. Now, why brown and white? It's just because this uh, brown, that burn number that I have, is really dark. And it's, it gives me, um, it's a color. You could do it in any color you want, as long as it gives you the value range of the image that you're intending on painting. So. Uh, that's why it's usually uh, artists start with the dark color because it gives them the broadest range range of value, uh, but the color doesn't necessarily uh, matter. Um, and uh, well, I guess to add to that, like yeah. the the reason I say um, color doesn't matter, and it totally matters, especially if it's what you're after. Um, it, what the reason I mention that is that if you're building an illustration or or painting. Um, of fine art painting, if you have really strong values before you go anywhere else, um, what what exact colors you put down don't really matter right. because your values are super strong. So if you look at like a Bouguereau painting or um, I don't know, any great, even um, Norman Rockwell, you make them, you bring them into um, Photoshop and make them black and white, they, they stand out perfectly because those artists just mastered their values first and then whatever temperature of colors they put down or um, chromas that that all just is you know that's icing on the cake so to speak yeah one thing i you know i recommend everyone do if you're 
you know, when um, you get a chance to uh, eventually go to a museum, um, What's that? If, if you have a chance, yeah, if you have a chance to go to a museum, walk around with your phone. And if your phone has an option in your camera to turn things into black and white, walk around and take a look at the paintings and guarantee you that the great paintings are going to read just fine in black and white. Mm -hmm. uh, you might even like them more, you know, uh, and it just goes to show you that the uh, values are really the understructure that's, uh, that builds this, this piece. Cause I'm going to throw some crazy colors on this. I, I mean, I think Tyler's and I, the, the, besides the, uh, the stock uh, the, process that we're using uh you know the colors i'm i'm going to change up you know and uh if i have to work i don't if i don't really have to worry about the values or whether uh then uh, it allows me to work on and have more fun with the colors but that yeah. is such, mm -hmm. just one way of working it's not i mean not uh it's not you know uh, the only way of working you know right i think there's a fun approach i think and if you have good strong yeah. values and you've you can just mix up like, let's say it's a whole, um, let's say it's a very muted piece, right? And you, but you mix up a highly saturated color that's like the exact right value as say this cheek area on her. If I were to put in that really high saturation paint onto the more muted area, but it's the exact same value, it'll almost blend right in. It'll just be this nice vibration. Um, it's a really cool thing to play around with when you start mixing and paints yeah but again you don't you would never understand or know how to look for that if you didn't have your your understanding of values in place and i guess that's what mm -hmm. we're trying to uh to say i guess and now i started with the background and uh, the hair because uh it's i like to surround the values uh and if i started with color like i did with the decker last time you'll actually see that i did the same thing i started with the background or the larger uh colors or uh, lar larger value shapes first uh because for me it helps me better identify the stuff that i need to put in on my um on the face uh and so uh, if i didn't have this dark in it would be very hard for me to read how light or how dark I need to go in the face because I'd be comparing off of whatever the the tone of my piece was, which was a light stain of of you know this burn umber wash. Uh, so I wouldn't make good value decisions. And if you notice, even though Tyler's going in straight for the face values, take a look at uh, the values in the shadow side of the face around here. You'll notice that he's just putting a piece of paint down that represents that dark of the hair because it's a very strong value that influences how other values look. Um, yeah, it's, re it's relativistic, right? Like the, yeah, uh, yeah, totally. your colors and values are really determined by what's around them. So yeah, I'm uh, putting in notes for myself so that I remember like, oh, this is the this side of her hair is one of the darkest areas of the piece. I just, I'm slapping that in there so that I remember like whatever I put next to that needs to be contextually relevant. Totally. Yeah, that's a that's a great way of uh, of uh, explaining it, you know. And like relative, what Tyler means by relative, like I'll, I'll show you, I'll give you an example on the, on my painting here. I'll place a value in right here, right? Uh, let's see. I'm just gonna, I'm just testing it out. There we go. Okay. It looks, you know, it looks like it's gray, right? But let's look at it. How you know, if it were in here. Mm -hmm. It's almost right? white. This it's it's almost white. It's the same exact value. Look, I mean, I'm not I'm not changing it up. So what changed? Are you and tricking me, to, dude? Yeah, are, are you, you tricking, tricking me? me? <laughs> Is this a part of the tracing process? We'll trace it. Is this the no. trick? This whole thing's a trick, everyone. Glad you tuned in for a trick. <laughs> Let me just turn off this Photoshop layer and <laughs> no. So, um, you know. So a value, whenever you're looking at a value, uh, it's very important that you check. Don't look at the individual value. Look at the value arrangement around it. And it helps when you're gauging what value to put down if you have the darkest values or the largest values, I should say. Not the darkest values, but the largest values in there. Because the small values, they're they'll be way easier to determine if you have the large values in because the, lar the larger the value shape, the more influence it has on the complete visual statement uh, that is your picture. 
And I think that's good. They use that term statement. You want to make your statement is your value structure, right? The yeah. it's, it's key to your composition. And I mean, I think we're getting in like, I mean, maybe we're getting inside baseball on this, but maybe if we, if we roll back just a little bit, like what's important to your image construction is first and foremost, your composition. Um, and that's determined by the things we just talked about, like your value structure, um, what's focused. I think we talked last week about what's in focus, what's out of focus and how you can yeah. play with focus. Those are all the keys. Like I build most of my illustrations out black and white first so that I can make sure that all of that stuff is strong. Like my composition is, is super strong. And then I can just start slapping color on there. Yeah, it's, it's uh man. I remember thinking about this as, as a student, like hearing, you know, Bill talk, Bill Mon or Craig Nelson talk. Yeah, and, these are some of our teachers, if you guys are unfamiliar with them. Yeah, and even like Randy Barrett, um, who you, you trained, you know, you, you studied with, you did a yeah. independent study with, uh, Matt Painter at Pixar, great artist. And, you know, I remember thinking, I would think sometimes like, how are, there's no way you could think about all the, you have to think about all these things at the same time. That's crazy, you know, and but it's true like you have to consider there are a lot of things to consider you have a lot more control over the how a piece uh ends up than you think you know and uh, you you know the more you train the more you understand the responsibility you have as an artist you know in the or at the hand you have in uh, a final image is uh, uh how an image basically shows up and it's final you know um, yeah, and it sounds daunting, right? Like trying to control all this stuff. But it's totally honestly, daunting. Yeah, it yeah. just takes time and practice to um to build it into your, I guess your lexicon of, yeah, of work. Yeah, yeah. I mean, um, oh it, my it's, god, it's not impossible, right? It just you just got to no, work yeah. at it. It just takes you know hours and hours and hours. It should, I mean, <laughs> years. We, we we've 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 struggled. I mean, I remember we we used to sit in the in in the bar, you know, uh, you know. Uh, in our favorite German place, um, yeah, yeah. In San, San Francisco. Francisco. And, uh, you know, with, uh, Hammonds was there, you know, and, you know, our good friend, Eric Johnson and, uh, Graham Ross, you know, other great artists. And, and we would just, as students, you know, we would think like, wow, we're never, how are we ever going to do this? You know, like, and we yeah. just feel like, I have no idea how you just don't see, you just don't see past the, per uh, a, a certain point in your development, especially when it's early on, and you're thinking like, I, I have no idea how how I'm ever going to be able to understand this stuff. And so, uh, but it, you know, we we just took one day at a time, you know, and we just you just keep keep going and coming back and studying more and trying more things. You understand slowly but surely, you start to understand things, uh, and you know, you realize there really are no short shortcuts to this. You know, when, when someone, when you meet a, an artist that's like extremely good, you know, they didn't, they didn't get good by accident. You know, it was a, a lot of work uh, that went into, uh, you know, the person that you, the artist that you see, you know, or the, fi the finished product that you see. Um, and I think that's, that's yeah. important. Yeah. It's like, th there's no, I mean, and I don't, I don't want to say like, you know, if you're a student out there listening or something, it's like, got to kill yourself for 10 years but you know you kind of got to kill yourself for 10 years yeah i mean um, it's you, a you gotta you yeah. gotta work you gotta yeah. work at it it's, it's not there's no shortcuts or tricks to get it to get good at it it's just you know it's 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 practice right it's and and like you gotta put in the, the hours yeah and do you think like I mean, we're not masochists right we're masochists enough that the fact that we've spent here and we you know paint for hours and hours and hours and try and outdo ourselves with every image that we create in our, our worst, you know, critics, you know, but like, do you think if there, if there was, it take it's so hard to be a, a professional artist uh, that if there was a shorter way of doing this, we would have taken it <laughs> I years ago. It. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I, me, done I wanted it to be, seconds. I wanted to be working right away. I really wanted yeah. to be. Um, and you know, I, I guess we're all working right away, but it's it's yeah. um, it's I wanted to be better than I was at the time, and I think everybody wants that. Yeah, and totally. it just uh, uh, you slowly, you know, the more and more work you do, and it's really about more and more and more work. Don't sit on one image forever. 
just do yes. more work. Yeah. If it's not just working, throw it away. Just throw it out and go to the next one. Um, otherwise, you just sit there beating a dead horse. I guess that's where that phrase comes from. <laughs> Yeah. But um, yeah, you've got to move forward. Um, don't try and make a piece perfect. Just learn from it, move to the next one. That's how you get better and better. So that's, um, how, I, I, that's how I got to where I'm at, I guess, now. Yeah, you, we get it. You paint a yeah, lot. Yeah, go ahead. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So... <laughs> <laughs> we get it. <laughs> we get it. You paint a Thanks, lot. Thanks, Kate. Thanks, Kate. Yeah, you bet. Can you get off the call, Kate? Can you get off the call? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Not a problem. Not a problem. Um, yeah. No, there was a there was a suggestion in the chat. We've been talking about the content that you guys are making for this channel. Um, there's also so many talented people in the chat, and some of them have been sharing their portfolios over the last few episodes. So we wow. might have to start a Discord server so that your community can share their portfolios and and get art feedback from each other. So that's a talk we can have offline. But yeah, sure. another suggestion that I really liked, um, I think, came from Evacuate. Uh, the idea that you guys could do an episode where you switch styles. So Tyler would paint like a very colorful picture of a building in the Bronx and Ray would paint a dragon or something, you know, like, Oh, dude, that'd be great. Let's yeah. do it. Let's Isn't that yeah. a great idea? Yeah. I love yeah. that. I love that. Yeah. I like yeah, that. Let's do I that. like that. I like that. There's also bring all of our powers to bear. Yes. Ta Talp, <laughs> I know both of you have done this before. And I, I know that it's, it can go a little off, off the rails, but the idea of doing art improv from what the chat is suggesting, like as you go, we did this for the charity stream, um, Tyler, and we <laughs> yeah. ended up making yeah, a horrifying did. creation, but you did, you just, you just rocked it so much, but I would love to figure out a way to make that not so chaotic. Like if at the end of every episode, people suggested, uh, I don't know, how, how, how would you guys like to take chat okay. input? I have an idea on this. Uh, and it's something I've done at, um, I do a lot of um, folks out there don't know. I do a lot of these uh, magic um, tournaments where they have artists sitting on the side. Um, so I, I go as a magic artist and I kind of uh, sit on the side of these huge tournaments and I have like prints and all that crap there. But um, every once in a while, it'll be like a, so I'll be doing a sketch on a, play mat or a card and someone will ask like hey can you add this to it or that so maybe that's the way we can do it where um i mean it's similar to what we did digitally right but we're we're, um, we're just kind of taking suggestions from the audience right and so you're, you're saying that like people could you could complete this beautiful uhura portrait and someone could be like now put a mustache on her that's that's what you want <laughs> exactly exactly <laughs> what i want <laughs> yeah or you could like uh if you wanted one, uh, one idea that i just had when i was when you were talking tyler is like you know the audience could say like all right uh you pick pick like three colors they want me to use in the creation of this piece uh, uh you know colors of a given piece and so it's like uh, it just to kind of prove our you know color really doesn't matter sort of thing like we can make it, you know, or her skin green and her head red. It didn't really, you know what I mean? Like it really, yeah, yeah. You know. Oh, interesting. Okay, um, so I was have a subject, but then have the audience pick like a color palette to work from. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, a great. This kind of reminds me of a this an awesome artist friend of mine, um, Eric Geist. If you've never heard of him, check him out. Really good. That's great. But he does that. His demos. He does that where he he works from like an old black and white photograph. And he just creates the colors as he goes. He uses the value structure as landmarks, but then he uses his understanding of form and how color shifts when it turns away from the light and specularity. He builds whatever colors he wants to use off of that black and white image, which is something Ray could technically do um, next week because he's going all black and white. Yeah, totally. I could. I could absolutely. You could if you want. I mean, I'm not telling you what to do. I'm just saying. I'm not, not going to tell you how to paint. I'm not going to tell you. And that's the end of our broadcast. <laughs> <laughs> this will be our last episode of Live Brush. Yeah, Ray and I had a falling out. We had a falling out. And that was it. <laughs> Friend, friends for years, we ended it. Art code, man. You don't tell a little. Art, friends don't. <laughs> Artists don't tell other art friends, you know, what colors to use. You know? <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. a code, man. Yeah. Yeah, I'll break code. the code. Yeah, do your thing. Oh, so I mean, I'm, 
I, I, we, one thing we have talked about um, offline is um, we kind of meander and, and get off, get out in the weeds, but we do want to try and check back into what we're doing and like talk a little yes, bit about it. It's yes. like, like Kate had said earlier, there, they'll be like, I imagine there are people in the chat. They're like, what the hell are they doing right there? Why don't they talk about that? Yeah. Um, so like right now what I'm doing is, or why aren't they doing this? You know? Oh, sure. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And everyone has different methods. Um, yeah. If there are people in the chat saying, why aren't they doing this? Definitely um, let us know, Kate, because that would be great to address. Um, why aren't you doing this? Yeah, uh, there's a lot of um, why aren't you painting better? Painting better. Yeah, right. a, oh, there okay. is a fair okay. amount of that. It's mostly, I would say like 90% of the messages is why can't mostly. they paint oh, yeah. better I'm than trying. this? Yeah, sorry for Tyler. Mostly he was a last me. minute fill-in for the host. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll get somebody better. Yeah, maybe but that's, it's, it's more like, can... sure, I'll get there. But it, like I said, I need 10 more years of practice and I'll get there, Ray. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, what, uh, what I'm doing here is um, on the reference I have off to the side over here, um, there's, I'm getting into the specularity on her face. The specularity is specular highlight. It's the it's where the light is reflecting, um, but, you know, if it's a shiny surface, it's where the light is reflecting back at me. And oftentimes that specularity is the color of the light. Um, it's like if you had a chrome ball, you get this perfect reflection of the light that's coming and hitting the chrome ball. The, you know, her face is not a chrome ball, but it is, it has specularity. So everywhere where it's going to get shiny, I'm going to see a closer color to what the color of the light is. Um, and off this reference here, her face is very warm tones, but the specularity is actually getting very cold. And I'm actually going to exaggerate that. I'm going to try and put like some almost blue, like straight blues down on here to, um, to exaggerate that cool specularity. Right, because it's, it's so that is your, what I'm doing is now. It a contrast between the warmth of what you're painting now and and the the blue provides that contrast because of the color color wheel stuff, right? You know, color yeah, wheel I stuff. mean the, the color wheel stuff. So yeah, we covered that color wheel. Covered that. Um, <laughs> to nail it is, that right yeah, down. That content done. Right down, right, right <laughs> down there. Well, I mean, like <laughs> on her face, particularly on her face, where her where the form turns away from the light, like up here on her temple or near her cheekbone, you're gonna get uh, you're gonna get really close to the local color because she's in white light. Right. Um, so we're gonna have we're gonna see a lot more of the local color of her skin right at that turn point. Um, sometimes it's great to get a little bit of green in there on when you're working in portraits. Um, I'm getting sort of like especially on this cheekbone over here that you can see is I'm getting a bunch of red in. Um, cause in the reference she's got, it's, it gets pretty saturated there, but you lose that level of saturation and local color when you're in the specular area. Um, she has a lot of specularity like here on the uh, ridge of her brow. Um, she has a lot of specularity, I'd say right around here. So I'm trying to get blue, more blue into these, um, just to reflect the light better. Here's a question from what do you think? Nick DeLuca 96. I don't care what Ray thinks. So for someone who wants to Good. build up Whew. for someone who wants to build up a fantasy portfolio, what should they focus on and what type of piece should they have or pieces should they have in their portfolio? And Nick also says the paintings are coming out really nice. Thanks, Nick. Um, this is a great well, question. Well being a There's fantasy something... artist, yeah, I'll I'll take this one. <laughs> Do it, Ray. <laughs> apples. Um, one word, apples. Yeah. Always have Fill it apples, with apples in your portfolio. <laughs> George R. R. Martin loves apples. George R. R. Martin loves um, apples. So I, have get, I get this question actually quite a lot at conventions, and my answer is always this. Target your portfolio. So please, like, art directors do not want to see everything you've ever done, especially if it's irrelevant to what they create. So build a portfolio. Like, if you want to work for Magic, build a portfolio or grab – samples from your existing portfolio that looks like magic work um, and only show them that if you only have three or four pieces but they're really strong only show them that you don't um you do not need to show an art director all of your sketches and practice and um, stuff that maybe even like concept art or visual development if if that art director doesn't do visual development so right. like I, i'll just use magic art directors as the example just 
bring them a portfolio that looks immediately to them like something they could put on their cards. That's the best way to get it. And, and only show them that. So if you want to do visual development, go to game companies and visual development studios with a portfolio that looks concept ready to be put into their game. Um, that's how you want to work it. Don't show them everything you've got. Really target it. Build different portfolios so that you're prepared for different markets that you might want to get into. That and pretty much can be, yeah, that. that can pretty much can be applied to any industry. To be honest with you, it's like, yeah, it's so simple, but it really is like, it's really that simple. It's the trick is making sure your work is as of the quality. It should look like it was already published, you know? Uh, right. No, that's a great point. Like yeah. if it's, if you have something in there that you feel is not necessarily as strong as it could be, throw it out. Do not keep it in your portfolio because any art director or gallery um, is going to remember the weakest piece that they saw. That's the one that's going to stand out. Um, and a lot of art directors I know when they see, they'll go through portfolios and not like anything in there, except they'll see one piece that's really strong. And their feedback almost always will be, I want to, I want you to come back, you know, to me in a few months with five more of this particular piece. And they'll point to the strongest one. Um, and they'll say, I want to see five of those. And that's a great place to start. If you have one strong piece, try and do five more that are in that same strength level. Agreed. Agreed, agreed, agreed. Yeah. You better, you better yeah. agree. Not that, yeah, not that I, I uh, as long as we all have to agree, so you know the audience has to agree if that was a good, uh, <laughs> good answer start, or not, um, right? Yeah, if it was a bad start answer, getting into like arguments, like Ray's full of shit on this. Don't listen yeah. to him. Oh my God. I guess we could talk about Star Trek: The Motion Picture if we wanted to get, get into that. <laughs> oh, so um. Okay, well, you know, it's better than five. It's better than Star Trek five. Sorry, I didn't uh, unmute. I, I not, made the bold comment. Star Trek four is the best Star Trek movie. Fight me in real life. Goodbye. Oh, my God. Okay, real question, it's... though. From A follow-up question from Nick DeLuca before we get into this, guys, before before yeah. we find ourselves lost in no, it's okay. Star this Trek isn't a Star four Trek worship. Uh, Nick DeLuca has a follow-up. Yeah. Would it be better for an instance, for instance, with Magic the Gathering, to use their characters and not your own for a portfolio directed toward them? Ooh. Um, I would I would suggest not doing that. Um, it's they might be they might think, oh wait a sec, did you did you publish our characters? They might feel that's weird. Um, it's not something I've really ever seen. I would I would really stick to trying to make it look like their work, but don't use their intellectual property. Um, I, I feel like you're going to get into a, sort of a strange place if if you show them their stuff, like their intellectual property. But you know, if it's fan art, I guess maybe I don't want to back up what I just said. But I mean, it's I would I would I'd avoid it. It seems like a right. sticky territory. Right, and and that's that's a good point. Like it depends on the in, but that's that's a great question because, like obviously, if you were uh, looking to get a job at Marvel, you'd want to do that. And, yeah, and, and right. Like, it's yeah. it's a tough spot to be in. Uh, but you also, you know, by not using their intellectual property to build your portfolio, you're also kind of showing them you're showing off your problem solving. Like you're right. solving it with different things. That's you're a good question. Come up with, with, with cool stuff, right? So that, that leads to other opportunities down the line. Right. It, right. It, you know, I mean, I can, I mean, and that's part of like what you get asked to do a lot of times, right? Is, is to understand how to, or to, you're asked to design characters, you know? Um, yeah. Um, yeah. I, I do a lot of visual development for Magic mm -hmm. as well. So there's a, I think I'm at the point we, we do concept pushes for magic where we, um, they bring in a bunch of artists sort of lost count of how many of those I've done, but it is important to show off your ability to uh, problem solve and create new designs. That, that'll go a long way. Um, so just showing them their own designs, I don't think is going to go as far um, for your 
career, it's always better to show them that you can really think outside the box. That, I mean, I, I'm, I'm putting myself in the position of like where what an art director might be looking for only because I've dealt with a, a lot of them, but there, there's a, they, they want to be blown away. And if they're seeing just they're all the, the stuff they all see all the time every day, they're going to be less blown away. Um, but if you can show them something really cool, new design that's crazy, but it looks like it could fit in their game, you're in a way better position. Here's a related question. Do you guys do AD work, art director work, or are you primarily just creatives? Um, I've done a little, but only a little. Um, <laughs> I only recently did some for an upcoming product for Magic um, where I was sort of, I'd say it was more of a concept lead as opposed to art direction. Um, whereas the real art direction of that set was handled by um, an art director, Zach Stella. So I'd say I've sort of dabbled in it a little bit, but I wouldn't say that it's something I've done much of. No, I, I haven't done uh, any any art direction, but uh, I, I I do teach at a, a university, so and do give assignments. So you know, you kind of have to act as art director um, with that. You know, I mean, what'd you learn from it? I, I mean, doing something like that it really helps me teaches me how to communicate, you know? Yeah, um, I'd say I'm, I'm in the same boat in that. Um, I, I've, over the years, I think, and I've helped with, you know, best practices at particular companies, but I've learned over the years sort of a, I think the best types of art direction, like the do's and don'ts of art direction. I think we went over a little of this last episode, um, or maybe it was the episode before, but, um, there are a lot of things that don't work. And I think what I've learned is over the years of, and with my limited experience with it is it's all about like setting the artist up for success. And that comes down to finding the right artist for the right job. You know, not every artist is the same, so you don't want to treat them all the same. You know, if it's something like magic and it's like a landscape, you wouldn't want to get just any artist. You'd want to get the, the best landscape artist you can find. Um, so it's it's all about finding the right person for the right job. And it's also understanding like through their work and looking at their work, um, what they're excited about. You want your artist to be super excited about a project. So you don't want to give them something that is not represented in their portfolio is that they're clearly not excited about that, the stuff that's not in there. Right. Yeah, I think that's a great, uh, uh, great point. Sorry, I was just damn, uh, damn right. <laughs> I was just uh, realizing that uh, the when I projected it, I think it might have been a little bit distorted, and I'm seeing some distortion in the uh, image, so it's causing it to look a little bit weird. Like it's so I've been correcting a lot of this stuff. So you see this mouth right here. I think it's in the wrong position. So what I do is I go like this. Well, I go right on it. You think oh, like never that. do that. Never do right. that. Oh, oh my God. Right. Ruined. Right. You've ruined it. It's ruined. Control Z. Yeah, it's ruined. Control Z. Control Z. Yeah. Control, so Z. control Z. Go back. I control back. Z this thing. I control C. I'm, oh. I'm using my clone tool, right? And I'm pushing this up. And so what this allows me to do is think of the form. Again, the drawing's gone, right? So now I actually really like when all the lines are covered up because now I can get back to sculpting. And I, I think that's what I want to do with this piece um, is I want to start to build some of the larger forms um, uh, up. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, essentially sand it this down. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to build up the lights and you're going to see it sort of emerge from this clump, lump of clay. Uh, uh, basically, and so at least I hope so. Because then I'm going to control Z this thing right back into oblivion, right? And so it's hard to a lot of it's hard to control Z with, with paint. Um, it's easy. It's easy, kids. It's easy. Don't let don't listen, to Uncle Tyler. I have a, another question from a dairy, but I'm about to sneeze. Let's see if it goes uh -oh. away. Don't do that's that. A, that's a very long twitch handle. Okay. 
opinion <laughs> on studying interesting materials such as history, cultures, and non-related artistic field stuff to oh, incorporate to visual libraries and storytelling abilities? 100% it does. But Ray, go ahead. No, I think you should be, uh, don't study anything because all the best artists are. Well, A number one, un believe yeah. everything that you read. That's what you yeah. got to do first. And the um, only thing you need to learn is from movies. Learn and never learn. Don't learn. Yeah. Guys, never ever learn. Yeah. Oh yeah, let me guys. be serious. Okay, let's be serious. I yeah. so I think there's a ton of value in that. Um, oh my like God. I love yeah. to learn about optics and physics and all of this stuff helps. Um, I love learning about science. I was like a science major when I first went to school, um, and that helps anatomy and creature design. And um, I love. Yeah. Um, historical armor and medieval combat that helps huge in fantasy for um, weapon design and armor design and um, adding like a layer of realism to uh, the, the designs you're working on. Now, that comes in handy for me a lot for um, visual development. But this is such a, it's such a great, the reason why I lo love this question is it points out something uh, that it's so hard, at least for me as a, as a teacher to get across as students is that, you've got to understand how to research and you've got to be smart. You have to always come from when you're painting uh, or drawing something, creating something, you have to come from it from an informed position. Mm -hmm. And so like, if you do not understand how armor works, how do you expect to design great armor? Yeah, it's or even really paint it. Or paint it, right? It's, I, there's just, you can't, right? So what, what do you get? Right. You get the worst armor designs that you see all the time because it's kind of something that's half remembered uh, from like, you know, a Saturday morning uh, cartoon that somebody saw, you know? Yeah, like He-Man or something. Like, like He-Man, which had awesome. Be armor. Really great armor. So, is that, yeah. is that Mattel? No, it wasn't me. Uh, it might have been Mattel. Yeah, it was Mattel, but it was... I can't uh, remember. Wait, come away. Uh, oh my God. I, I, Chat, I should know this. Who was it? Chad, who was the, uh, the no, forget about the, the, the toy company, but the, um, who did the animation? It was one, it was a studio, and Do you want me I to can't... this for you so you don't flounder? He Man Animation Studio? Filmation. Boom. Done. See? Filmation. Done. We did it. I helped. Didn't even it. need the internet. It was. It was Filmation. I, I, I checked the internet of my brain. I like to never look anything up on the internet and just say what it is, yeah, you what I that, think it is with authority. You do that a lot. Yeah. And then it when works. you don't know the answer, you're like, I wish we could find out. And then you leave it there. <clears throat> yeah, it's a good joke. I like to use jokes. What Most of his answers know. today have been like that. Uh, yeah, I just, I just make it up. Eva Quate <laughs> would like to know, um, I know, I think I know how at least one of you feels about this. What's your opinion on the chain bikini or the, you know, the metal bikini? Mm-hmm. <laughs> The chain bikini. Uh, wow. I get into trouble a lot with my opinions on what armor should be and shouldn't be. And uh, I don't know. Do we want to get into this? Do we want to get into the functionality of armor? And... Yeah, because I am I am relatively pro chain bikini. Chain I'm you not. Are extremely I'm not. I am against it. Yes. Go ahead. Get into it. I'm against it. It is it, it is not functional unless you want to die quick. Um, I don't know. I don't know if I want to get. To, I'm going to turn into like a raving lunatic. I don't want to get, go down this rabbit hole. I don't know. Okay, what do you think? The, the good. Uh, if it's good for the show. If it's good for the you... show. I mean, there's no such thing as bad publicity. But no, I think yeah. that I think that uh, this audience needs to know exactly what they're getting themselves into by adhering to your by listening to this show. Thought. Okay. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Well, um, I am a big proponent of authenticity when it comes to fantasy weaponry and design like um, armor and weapons all serve a function unless they're magical then you can start stepping outside of the realm um so you know okay so chain magical chainmail bikini right there you go well that's fine that's fine that's fine, okay, all right, fine. you can do that <laughs> you just have to say magical that's all i don't even think you should don't bury the lead that's <laughs> Yeah, I uh, go ahead. I, so, do you think you're more of like the Richard Taylor type of school of 
fantasy. Yeah. Oh, I mean, yeah. I, I like um, I I like painting things that look getting starting to look close to realistic. So I am I kind of I really love just understanding how armor and stuff works yeah. and why it's um, made the way it is made. I'm I even do like longsword just for uh, my own fun exercise time. I do German longsword. Because I like to understand that combat system, and it just helps inform my fantasy art. I will tell you that all of the just from talking to Tyler and talking to Carlos Ipperspat, Tyler and uh, Chris Ron, and uh, hearing uh, people like Carlos Ortiz talk, you know, really incredible uh, conceptual artists. You know, that understand how to generate and design things that fit in worlds. The one common uh, thread that they have is they're all very curious people uh, and very educated people because of that. Uh, and so because, he, remember, it's like garbage in, garbage out, right? So it's like you're drawing, right? It's just safe to assume that you're drawing from your knowledge every time you're drawing things, right? And so yeah. if there's nothing there, then, you know, what is there, right? Well, it's the same argument that you, an artist can't work in a vacuum. Um, right. So your like your your knowledge of items in this universe can't operate in a vac vacuum. Just like you can't operate without feedback. Um, you can't get yeah. better without feedback. Yeah, that's just, uh, and this is like, I think you you just you hit it right on the, the nail right there. I think that's the that's the big thing. Even as like a, a gallery, uh, as a gallery painter, you know, you have to, you have to be a curious person and you have to come at things from an intelligent, informed advantage point. And you just, if it looks like people are just doing whatever they want, it's really not the case. You know, uh, I, I have, everything I do is very informed. I, I think very intensely about it and understand why I'm doing something. And so, you know, Seriously, when, when people ask us, when, when we, we, I mean, I know we joked about it, like, when we said, uh, like, please ask us, like, why are you doing something? And we joked about that. But it's, it's true. I mean, feel free to ask us the reason why. And that's uh, uh, why we do something, because our teacher, Bill Mon, I think, really instilled this in us is you have to have a reason, right? Because you're in control of this picture. And yeah. it, it, it fails or is successful based off of what you do. Uh, and um, so you have to understand what you're doing and then uh, so that you can do it again and again and again and again and again and again, right? Because, you know, you don't want to have a, a career where you only did one cool thing, you know, and, and everything else is kind of lame, you know? Uh, so... Yeah, that, that requires a, a critical eye and investigation and curiosity. Like, you really want to dig into things. There's nothing wrong with, you know, deep diving into a subject because it's just going to help your art yeah. in the end. And you could tell, you could just tell, you could tell in the, uh, in the design. I, I don't know. I, I, I'm going to go ahead and go out and, and, and just say that. Like I can like look at Lord of the Rings for goodness sake. Like they, you know, a lot of, you look at the armor, right? It's like, there's a reason yeah. why like those swords are functional. They're all functional. You know, and yeah, they did their research, right? Yeah, and they actually had experts. Like, uh, it's the reason why, you know, uh, for instance, it, it, that's an all making of things. Like, look at the Apple Watch, right? Uh, you know, or or anything like like that, like tech uh, base. You know, they, that's a fitness watch. You know, Apple brought in fitness experts, actual people who train people in fitness, fitness trainers. And scientists, you know, uh, they didn't just say, we're just going to make some fitness watch, Google it, and then call it a day. I mean, yeah, they spent a considerable amount of time doing that. Animation industry, you know, uh, uh, Pixar, classic example. Uh, I love seeing the Finding Nemo, making of Finding Nemo. If you could find it on YouTube, do it. Uh, and you'll see, like, every single one of those artists got scuba certified. Mm -hmm. Right? It's like, why? They, they, they're not going to be animating underwater. Like right, you know, or in a in a ship, right? Uh, but because they were trying to 
capture underwater life, you know, uh, for an entire Yeah, it movie. informs yeah. it informs their art. Yeah. It's super useful. So you could you know, I mean, uh, you don't gotta go like if you want to do a painting, I guess you don't gotta go get scuba certified, but it's not it's not gonna help. It's like it's not gonna hurt you. It's gonna be helpful. Yeah. The more you, know, you know, the the better you the better you are at creating stuff. Well, you know, also like you've seen, it's like you you might have an artist that like, like for instance, like you, you paint a tree, Tyler, right? And I look at that tree and I think, you know, like uh, in the background uh, or a cloud. And I, I look at that and, I, and I, I know as an artist, I'm like, you've probably seen something like that, you know? And right. you've took note of that and studied it and understood how uh, it worked and then was able to, use that uh in in your own work and make it your own thing you know uh and i i think that's uh it just goes full circle as to what we're what we're saying and that's all a part of the the equation right it's like you have to holistically you have to be just a, a well-informed curious individual that's uh willing to constantly uh learn new things uh, because i think it's if you don't then you don't grow and then uh, that's the, the, the death i know for a uh, for an artist is one that's you know becomes stagnant and uh, i just had an uh, interesting idea for uh, something you guys could do painting wise i have to yeah. assume between the two of you your education and experience has led you to paint everything that there is and and in certain cases everything even that there isn't but mm -hmm, close you, to it. There was a there was a question about this earlier in the chat, and I skipped over it um, accidentally. But it was sort of related, which is uh, the question in the chat was: Are there any elements of painting that you actively avoid, like hands or faces or feet or whatever that that people obviously faces probably not. But um, are there any things? And uh, my question to add on to that is: Are there any subjects that y'all would feel like uncomfortable painting because you don't know enough about it? A great question. They're both great questions. Um, do you want you want to take it, Tyler, or you want me to take it? Uh, I, I mean, I I can at least jump. Like, I am not great at um, like strict plans. Anything. I'm not good at anything, and I've painted nothing. <laughs> no, I mean, I've I've definitely painted almost everything. I think at this point, but um, I'm not great at like landscapes. I know where my strengths are. I'm not. I'd like to get better at that, but I'm, I'm going to work at it. Um, I think I'm great at oh, thanks, Ray. Thanks, Ray. Um, I don't think I'm great at it, and that's all that matters. Yeah, it's not but, great. It's not. It's not your best. <laughs> but you know, I want to get better at that stuff. But um, you know, I'm I'm just thinking of like you know Frank Frazetta was hated drawing feet, and so you when did? you look through all of his yeah, when you look through all of his stuff, he's always hiding those feet. Yeah. Wow. Um, well, I, I yeah. Wow. I never. Uh, I, I don't <laughs> like drawing feet either. either. <laughs> yeah. I. Uh, hmm, what do, don't I like? That's a good question. Uh, or what do I actively try and avoid? I don't actually try to avoid anything. Really. I don't think we. I don't think any of us. I, I don't think you do either, Tyler. I mean, well, uh, I'd say if I had to be honest, I I honestly actively actively try to avoid architecture. Yeah, architecture I'm sucks. Very bad yeah. at it. And that comes from someone who paints cityscapes. Yeah, you uh, paint architecture all the time. But you paint I, amazing. I, I, right? And yeah. I and I hate I hate I hate painting. <laughs> I hate the process that I have to go through I hate to my do work. it. I, I just hate it. I just. It's a struggle all the time, you know. That's, but a, that's struggle, a great, but that's you know. a great segue, though, right? Is is not to avoid the question, but at least a little sidebar is things that you struggle with. You try and find more efficient ways to do them, so they're less of a pain. Totally, um, and that can make you a better. That, that alone can make you a better artist. Yeah, totally. Uh, I mean, I, I love I. I think as illustrators. Our, our training was a little different though, right? Because we, we had to be good at everything. Yeah. And it, and, and sure. Like our, our work has pulled us in, in directions that has like caused us to, uh, I don't know how to say it has, has had us doing more of one thing than the other. Right. But, uh, we still have the tools 
to help us like become better at whatever we, you know, we sort of lack in terms of atrophy and in terms of the skills, you know? Um, yeah. Like for I me, I don't like perspective. I don't like heavy perspectives. Yeah. I don't like heavy perspective to learn either. Yeah. yeah. That's, it, that's, it, I, I struggle with perspective, uh, 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 quite a bit. And I spent a long time figuring out the perspective in my reference so that I don't have to worry about it later, to be honest with you. Um, yeah, and I use digital tools for that too. Yeah, like, yeah. I can't, I can't spend the rest of my life plotting this out. I gotta yeah, get this done. <laughs> so it's brutal. It's brutal. And we have done it. I mean, there's no, no doubt about it. I just, I haven't done it well, you know, and I, that's something I, I definitely, I think need to work on. Um, I definitely need to, I'm always trying to expand my knowledge of anatomy and structure and, and also like figurative painting. Like I, I, I'm trying to get back into it and, um, and pack back into uh, doing that. Cause I, for a lot of illustration work, I did a lot of figures and uh, my gallery work doesn't have me doing as much figures as we're doing things that I never used to do, which is we're still life and landscape. And uh, so, yeah, I mean, I, I I, I really like painting subject matter that I don't usually paint like like this, you know, portraiture. This is stuff like I I mean you and I both miss this stuff quite a bit when we talked about yeah. it, which is why we do this there's, stuff, you know. There's something like Zen like about painting these kinds of things. Like I'm, I think my you know, my day to day is like solving a really complicated illustration. Um you know we're both kind of have our day to day on that, like really complex images that have a lot going on in them. Totally. And so there's like a nice meditative thing of just worrying about face and structure. There's one and a little bit of color, there. a little bit of light. It's, it's relaxing. Totally. No, I, yeah, I absolutely agree. I mean, I, I think both of us, you know, in our day to day work, it's like we're, we're really every piece we do, I'm, we're just trying to just, push each other uh, push ourselves as hard as possible like, to try and outdo the last thing we did and mm -hmm. uh it, it can be very exhausting work right and because it's you're trying to go beyond what you've done before and to do that you've got to go in the unknown and the unknown is exhausting because you don't know what's there right and uh yeah it takes a lot of brain power to go into that space oh my god man just the just and, and the struggle is just I was just gonna say, and the struggle is real, but it, it really is. It really is. Uh, I, you know, I, I know there's paintings I've sent Tyler, and like, you know, like I am just completely. I just, I, I can't, I can't. I'm struggling. There's, there's a billion colors here. Like, I, I just want to throw this painting in and incinerate it. You know, uh, yeah. and uh, yeah, I felt that when a painting is going wrong, and you're just like, oh. Yeah, this thing's done. I hate it. Yeah, and with these these portraits, I, I don't mind repainting something. I, I mean, and also this comes from a lot of experience and, you know, like, okay, I messed up. I've got to repaint this thing. Now here's how, how I did it, you know. Uh, this is how I remember doing it. Um, Kate, how are we doing on time? Our, you got 20, 20 minutes left? Okay. Nice. Yeah. I might have, you I'm crush, thinking you about. Well, we taught them everything there is. So, yeah, yeah I know, right? so we can wrap it up. We, we taught them all this stuff. <laughs> Nothing else. Oh, so, I'm, you know, I'm actually going to, Tyler, I think I'm going to switch to oil paints. Are oh, you going in? It's going in. Everybody. Yeah, I think, I think I am. So, I will take a, I should probably, you know what? No, I, I'll take a photo of this. What do you think, Kate? I should probably take a photo of this before I go Hell to this yeah. next step. I want to see. Yeah, I'd, I I'd, I'd love to compare your underpainting to the final thing. True. I should do that. Okay. So I'll, I'll just, I'll spend the last 20 minutes kind of tweaking this underpainting. It doesn't, uh, so, okay. If you're starting out with an underpainting uh, in, in oil paint uh, or, or doing this type of method, figure out, I paint everything as if you're trying to make it a finished piece because you're, the, the, the goal is, and always ask yourself, what is the point of a given step, right? Um, yeah. don't, don't never follow anything that we do blindly uh, or anything, you know, blindly. Um, so the, I, uh, the point of all of this is so that you don't have to 
worry about how light or how dark to make something. You don't have to worry about accuracy and proportion, any of that stuff. When uh, you go on to the color stage, that's where you want to be if you're first starting out with this type of process. Um, I am uh, going to stop in a little bit and I'm, I'm going to be happy with this underpainting because it answers the mo uh, most of the questions for me. Uh, and the, the most important ones, which is basically like the, the big, big values. And it's got everything that I need kind of in, uh, in that I, I, I would need to go on and start to paint in full color. The form is unfinished, uh, obviously, and the structure needs to, is very generalized, uh, but I'm gonna, I can handle that stuff uh, in, uh, in my color lay, which I will do in, uh, I will do in oil paints, I guess. What do you think, Tyler? I think I, th I want to do it in oil paints. But I think I want to do it. Go for it. Yeah. Go for it. And that that allowed me to kind of like mush things around and you know, remove things. Oils keep since they keep dry, uh, you know, they keep wet. I should say um, longer. It, it it's easier to maneuver and and manipulate. So I don't have to. I'm not committed to a value. Uh, like I am with acrylics. So, so I could spend time mixing the value, but then once I put it down, it'll pretty much be dry by the time I mix another one. So, um, which has its advantages, you know, uh, of course. Uh, it's always important to step back and take a look at it and take a look at what you've done so that you can either look in, in horror or in, uh, in amazement, you know. <laughs> Yeah, if you have the ability to to get farther away from your canvas, do it. Um, yeah, if you're yeah. working digitally, zoom way out. Um, zoom way out, right? It's really good to get a different perspective on something from far away because you can just get buried in your own mind when you're super close to the painting. Yep. I have a question. This comes from this one comes from me. How do you know when? Because every time I've ever done anything creative, that middle period, the whole thing is a slog of like, this is trash. This is a dumpster yeah. fire. I should burn this in private so no one even has to see the smoke. So how do you tell the difference between you're just in the midst of that creative horribleness and this is a painting that needs to go in the garbage? So uh, I'll, uh, I'll take the lead on this one. I think it's... Yeah. it's uh, experience you've known enough of it uh to kind of gauge like i i, I painted enough and uh that i know when i'm dealing i'm in a specific s uh, stage because i've gauged the feelings that i have in that stage right and uh and it all goes back to kind of problem solving it's like what have i tried to attempt to solve uh, in this and so if i have a clear goal uh it's usually a, uh, a manageable experience if i don't and it's usually when I'm trying to attempt something that is beyond what I think I've done before, which has been this, these last group of paintings that I'm working on. Uh, it's tough because I try and stick to a plan, but that plan kind of gets blown up, right? Because I, I get kind of, you know, uh, knocked around by, by the painting itself. Uh, so it just, I think it's a, but that being said, I, I know that if I just keep going, it'll be fine. But the only reason why I know that it's because I've done a lot of paintings, but there's always an ugly, that middle part. It's, it's awful. I mean, I, I don't like it. Uh, and, uh, I try and get out of it as quickly as possible, but sometimes you're just in it because you, you've got to, you know, that there's something in there that you have to br build out. And, and, and sometimes the painting's willing to come out, uh, early, but, uh, and sometimes it's willing, not willing to come out at all. Right. And so you got to kind of, uh, you know, uh, take a crowbar to the door and rip it open. Well, I don't know if, if you've experienced this, Ray, but I mean, I, I think I experience it every time is I feel like I'm lost in the weeds on a piece and it's dead and unsalvageable. And then all of a sudden I'm like, okay, I'm gonna sit down I'm gonna keep working on it. And then all of a sudden it just falls together yeah. with a few strokes. Um, yeah. Yeah. That happens a lot to me. So it's yeah. hard. I don't even know if I have an answer for um, when I think I've done it or finished it. For some reason, it just there's a point where you're, you're working on it and there's just a last few bit of paint and it's like, oh, totally. that's it. I'm there. Totally. 
Yeah, totally. I, 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 I totally agree with that. And that's, you know, and you, uh, I've, I, I finished up a, a piece recently. So that, and that happened to me, you know, uh, where I'm like, I have another three days on this thing. And then all of a sudden it was done, you know, and yeah. it was, you know, in a few hours and, um, and that's you pushing. Yeah. You know, I think that's a result of, you know, uh, that happens more when it's, it's just, you constantly pushing into that unknown, you know, with this portrait, I know, I know how to finish this thing, you know, and uh, I could have attempted to probably get close to the finish today, you know, with, uh, with going to full color, but I, I kind of wanted to dance around with it and, and, and play around with a couple of things and to see how much of the spontaneity I can uh, kind of keep uh, uh, in this. Uh, and uh, so I'm willing to keep it kind of like in this unfinished state, but uh, usually I'm, I'm the same way with, uh, I'm, I'm not, it's not the case with, with paintings that I, that I do. Um, but again, I think we, we know that like, uh, when you finish a piece like that, and the genesis of that piece is, it, it makes sense to you. Like you see the pattern like, oh yeah, I did this and this, and that's why I struggled then. I, yeah. Okay, I finished that up. I here were the issues with it. At least I can remember, like, okay, that's why I struggled with this. But right. I always look back at the piece, like I always forget, like I know that I struggled, but I always forget how much I struggled and how much I wanted to throw the piece out of the window, you know. Uh, and <clears throat> uh, I'm just overwhelmed that, like, oh wow, I actually finished it, and I'm really happy with it. It's it's its own thing. I usually came it comes out like in a way that I didn't fully expect and uh you know it's like isn't it great and you know and then the more time you spend away from that piece i think the more rosier your recollection is of it you know i know for me, like that's the case you know like yeah. oh yeah it was really great you know and it's, it's you know and, and it's like it's very it's awesome and romantic to be like yeah you know i struggled and you know i couldn't sleep but then i just figured it out you know and like it's kind of like re the retelling of a tale is a lot more romantic than the actual tale itself. Like, you know, mm -hmm. because you, you tend not to remember crying in the corner and, you know. Uh, <laughs> I mean, each, I've found the same though, man. Like each piece has been, each piece is kind of like a little battle. And, yeah. um, you know, you get to the end and you're like, oh, it, it worked out. Uh, I was in the, I don't think there's ever like a stage where, I don't think there's ever a painting I've ever done where it's been like, yeah, this all worked perfectly the whole time. It's yeah. always like, oh, so there's always a no oh shit moment where I'm like, what the hell? How am I going to get out of this? Um, you know that, that that sensation you were saying that when you, uh, um, it just sort of comes together? Uh, yeah. Harvey, Harvey Dunn uh, would always say, who, who's a really famous illustrator and, and uh, teacher. Uh, you should look him up uh, if you don't know him for those in the, the chat. Uh, Harvey uh, Dunn, D-U-N-N. Um, yeah, it's great. Uh, you would describe that stage as the point on which the art, uh, the artist got out of th their own way and let the painting be the painting and just, and basically like you, you, the painting is going to be what it is and you have to just get out of your, get out of its way, you know, and let it, let it happen. Uh, and it's such as Zen, like, like when I first read that, I'm like, Harvey Dunn smoking some shit, you know, in this, you know, <laughs> and I don't know what o opioid he was on, but like, what is he talking about? Right. And so, yeah. but it wasn't until like years later that I started to understand and like recently started to understand what that meant. And I probably know that I still don't fully understand uh, what that means because he was painting probably at that point, like, you know well over 40 years you know uh and right i mean i, I that's my, my thinking too i'm like maybe in like maybe when i'm 80 years old i'm gonna understand some of this stuff yeah right right before that like uh you know meteorite hits you or something like that yeah so i oh, mean yeah. anyone out there listening who's like oh what this if you're still really listening, hard. right? If they're yeah, still if you're still there. listening. If you're like, God, these guys don't shut the hell up. Um, if you're still listening, um, these things are definitely hard. And 
not like Ray and I have figured out how to do everything. We figured out how to do a bunch of things, but there's there you never stop the learning process on all of this. Yeah, yeah no. In fact, yeah. if you've stopped your learning process, there's something wrong. I always think yeah. of it, there's an artist, Angus McBride. He, he said, if you like the work that you did five years ago, you're slipping. Um, so oh, that's great. That's great. Um, always be critical of your own stuff. Always push to make it better and better and better. Never get complacent. Uh, this one's coming together here. Um, I, yeah, I, it looks I've great. Just kind of, I've kind of blocked in plane changes. I don't know if this camera's showing it very well, but um, you know, I've, I've I've made up a little cooler light on the backside here, reflecting it from the environment. Yeah, in the photograph, beautiful. it's all pretty warm, but I'm exaggerating what I think would be over on this side. Um, the values in the photograph you can tell are are shifting because of um, reflected light but I'm making them a lot grayer than the, the actual skin tone. Yeah, my, uh, playing around. Like my video feed looks a little overexposed as to what the actual painting is. Uh, when I post a picture, well, we'll I'll figure it out in the next stream. But uh, yeah, yeah, we'll get, less, we'll get good photos out there for everyone. Less glare. Do you have your polarized filters on your, um, on your uh, lights? I do. Um, but because I don't have a polarizer over my lens, um, there's probably a little bit of glare and the, and the darks are probably not as dark as they could be. Right. Um, what we're talking about here, folks, is um, we recently, thanks to an artist friend of mine, Howard Lyon. Yeah, um, Howard, awesome, an awesome artist. Incredible artist, artist. please look yeah. him up. Um, but he was, I was on a gig with him for Wizards of the Coast recently and we we're working together on concepts, but he just kind of we went into the the weeds of talking shop and talking about photography like photographing your work and we found like getting he he told me about these um polarized films you can put over your over your lights so above me I have two lights and I have a, a polarized film which is a film that only lets one angle of light through and then you put a polar, a circular polarizer over your camera lens. And that's also only letting one angle of light through. And so it's kind of magical. Ray and I were talking about it. When you put it into place and then you turn the polarizer and all the glare just vanishes from your painting. Yeah, so you're essentially turning the, you're turning the circular polarizer so it matches the angle of the linear polarizer that you have on your lights, basically. So it's yeah, once, totally. you match, once they match up, when you because that's why you need a circular polarizer on your camera because the angle changes all the time. You match that up, the glare uh, disappears. And, uh, but, but also, I mean, what also disappears is the, um, there's an aspect of, of oil paints where some of them, like these, these dark, dark ones I'm using right now, they dry really matte. Um, and, and you have to oil out in order to make them deep again. But with this polarizer on, which that we talked about in as well. episode episode one. If you uh, yeah. need to, yeah, look, check, take a look at that on uh, the video on demand for. I think it's it's up on YouTube actually, so uh, you can yeah, they're on YouTube. We we, we cover uh, oiling out. Sorry, Tyler. Yeah, yeah we'll no, but yeah, that. it's it. You oil out specifically to wake up those um those really dark shadow areas that can tend to dry very matte, um, and so you get a more accurate view of what those colors are. Um, but with these polarizers, you can photograph it, and all of a sudden, that those matte areas just become incredibly deep, as if you oiled out. It's it's truly like some optic magic. Uh, it's it's been Ray and I've been kind of raving about it lately. So thanks oh a lot, God, Howard, yeah. if you're yeah, out there yeah, listening. Wow, to, you saved and changed my entire art photography, like photographing my paintings. That whole process is now different. In a can, much better way. I can give you guys a little three-minute warning here. Yeah, now Tyler and I have something to talk about, except for our mutual hate for each other. So thank you. <laughs> Finally, jeez. Finally. Sorry, I unmuted the stream, but not myself on Zoom. Three-minute warning. Okay. Three-minute warning. Well, what three should we talk minutes. about in three minutes? Um, oh, I'm just well, uh, kind of blocking in. Go ahead, Ray. Go ahead. Talk. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, I, don't, I mean, I, I'm, I want people to... Yeah, I, I'm... Uh, 
I'm just basically just setting up this layer for my next uh, my next layer. So there's certain things I'm doing, certain things I'm not doing. So I'm not putting in any fine detail, and uh, I'm going to leave it at a certain state, uh, which I, I there's a lot of things I like about this. And uh, when I take a photo of it, and I will post it on Instagram. Um, Live Dash is our Instagram handle, so make sure you follow us uh, if you want to see this stuff. Um, and uh, yeah, you'll, you'll see there's a there's some spontaneity that I want to actually um, keep uh, in, uh, in the in the finish. And if I can do that, it'd be awesome, you know. If I can't, then uh, which is probably the case, <laughs> then uh, nothing will change, you know. Uh, so go ahead, Tyler. Oh, I mean, I'm right here. I'm just kind of, I'm working on that. That's Fumato that we talked about last time. Um, I'm trying to, because I know I'm going to have a few sessions on this and it's going to dry. I'm trying to blur a bunch of edges with just a brush that kind of has no paint on it. Um, because this paint is already wet, I'm just basically smudging all the edges to get just softer. I want to, in the next session, I really want to kind of target the focus of this image. Um, so I'm just going to soften as much of it as I can. Um, and a, a great way that I've learned to kind of push this paint around is to either take a brush that's kind of dirty and get most of the paint out of it and then put a little medium on that. And then I get, then I kind of use this rag and get most of it out. So it's just basically a, a brush with some medium in it. And then I can use that to blur these edges, get that smoke feel, like all the edges are smoke. Yeah. Um, I, I, the areas where I want to keep it really sharp are going to be this sort of triangle on her face of her eyes to her mouth. That's what I'll keep sharp. So I'm going to try and soften everything else. Um, and when I go back into it next week, I'll just be, Tightening it all up. Okay. All right. Thanks for joining us, folks. We got a lot of links. We got um, bods up on the YouTube now. Um, we built. Uh, what do we build, Ray? We built a um, Instagram, essentially its own page yeah. for this. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Live We built Instagram. Instagram, is what I mean. We built Instagram. Thank you. Welcome. It's a couple of things. Yeah. There's so. links. Links to both the YouTube and the Instagram are in the chat. Awesome. All right. Okay, cool. Check out the chat, folks. And, and Ray and I can't see the chat, so thank you so much to Kate Yeah, thank for you so much. Yeah. Relaying You're everything. You're welcome. Yeah, it's, it's always a, we couldn't really do the show without you. Uh, we get a lot of complaints if we did, I'm sure. <laughs> You're going to get a lot of complaints anyway. We wouldn't know what Kate also has her show. Yeah. <laughs> So, Kate has her yes. show after this. Yes, yeah, stick around um, for, for Kate's uh, stream. Yeah, I'll uh, raid it, my channel. Anybody who wants to it, come on. Yeah, over. if you want to yeah. if you want to see how it's really done, how would she be done? You know? <laughs> Today's not going to be a good example of that. Thanks, Ray. <laughs> but she she will be on with the um, the amazing and hilarious uh, Chris Straub. That's right. And uh, what are you guys going to be playing? We don't know yet. I think I think oh, he's cool. going to play grounded, and I'm going to run commentary while he does that. So. We'll see. It's the unnamed well, Chris Straub stream. Tune in, folks. Tune in. Thank so, you guys uh, so much. Yeah, th I've, I am really enjoying all the conversations we're having in the chat. I'm not relaying most of it to you guys because your conversation is so great, but we have a really cool community that's showing up. Um, and so I'm, I'm super grateful. Awesome. Uh, once we figure out what we're going to do as far as the Discord and everything, we will post that on our Instagram. So make sure you follow us there. And we can start uniting all of these awesome artists together, and everybody can get more talented and and uh, level up together. Yeah, I mean that's our whole point, right? We want to pay our education forward in a way, and just let people know how we learn things, how we think about things. Um, no one has. There's no rule on how to do everything correctly. There's all kinds of different approaches, and that's why we have this format with Ray and I together. Totally. So we just want to spread that uh, as far and wide as possible. You know? So yeah. thank you. Thank you again, everyone, for uh, uh, joining us, uh, as always. Uh, next week, uh, tune in next week if you want to, to see us uh, finish these things off. And uh, thank you again to Kate. Thank you, Tyler. And, uh, yeah, happy painting, everyone.
Yeah. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye.